about five feet long. I picked him up. He didn't, he wasn't too excited about being picked up. He kind of moved around, but he made no attempt to bite me. I never grabbed his head to keep him from, from biting me. And he was just wanting to get down. And so he was kind of moving around, putting until he, I finally let him back down on the ground. And so that's the kind of snake reaction that is actually most snakes in America. Most do not want to bite you. There are a few very, very defensive snakes and they will bite in self-defense when you cause them problems. And so those are the ones, some of the water snakes are very, very aggressive when you bother them, even though they're non-venomous, and they will uh, certainly strike to defend themselves. But that is, again, the minority, and even if it does strike you, you're not gonna get hurt by that. It'll just you know, do some damage. And then we have those very few, like I said, which are venomous. And so you need to know which those are. And so this is the thing that everybody should do. Go find out what animal, what snakes in your backyard are potentially venomous. Like I said, there's two species in this area, the rattlesnake and the copperhead. That's it. Those are the only two in Northern Virginia, Maryland, DC area, which are actually venomous. And if you can look at the rattle, you look at the, at the end of the tail, does it have a rattle? If it does not have a rattle, it's not a rattlesnake. And then the other one is the copperhead, which is banded pink and brown. Very distinctive colorations. Look at it in a book. It looks like nothing else. And if you don't see those two options, it's harmless. Leave it alone. It's doing a good job. Uh, two weeks ago, we were down in uh, North Carolina. And in somebody's backyard, I found an eastern king snake. And he was about three feet long. And I picked that one up. And that one was a friendly snake. It made no effort to get out of my hand. It just crawled around peacefully. King snakes are some of the nicest snakes you've ever met. They make no effort to bite you, even when you're handling them. And so that's a very, very friendly snake. That snake is out there eating rodents. And it's also eating snakes. That's why they're called a king snake. And they're out there eating rattlesnakes and eating copperheads and eating the other venomous snakes, which are going to cause you problems. So if you go out and kill the king snake, you've now increased your problems on that area as well. So it becomes very important to know what you are looking at, know what species is there, and then ignore the rest. Because there's only very few which are dangerous in any given area, even some of the places down in Arizona, which have lots of rattlesnakes. Um, there's still the majority of the species down there which are non-venomous, helpful, beneficial. And so that's my point, is that it doesn't become a thing of being a friend of a snake. It becomes a thing of not being their enemy, because they want to be left alone. And they don't enjoy being put in a tank in your, in your, in your bedroom and turned into a pet, because that's a life in a bathtub, and they're not enjoying that. And so I'm not in favor of keeping snakes as pets either. And there's no interaction there that justifies that. It's not like taking care of a dog or a cat or a rabbit or something like that that really does love having us around. These animals have no interest in us, and they'd want to be left alone. Um, my wife is a school teacher, and she has this wonderful story of how when she uh, had this snake in a terrarium at a school that she was substituting at, and it never got out of its tank, it never got released, it was just always in there, and she felt sorry for it, so she pulled it out and played with it for a little bit and let him crawl around on the counter when nobody was around. That snake, when, it, when she came to put it back into its tub, did everything it possibly could to avoid being put back into that tub. That's prison for him. That's misery. And so it's like he, he crawled all around the back, and he tried to hang on to every last thing that he could hold on to, where before, when she wasn't trying to put him back into the tub, he was peaceful and contented, and everything was fine. So they have personalities, too. And they have wants and desires, just like all other animals. And so again, doesn't mean you have to cuddle up to them, but at the same time, just leave them alone, and everybody wins when that happens. And uh, if you do have a venomous snake in your backyard, that's no good. You don't want to do that. You don't want to have a venomous snake which can cause you problems or, or bite your pets or things like that. You have two choices. You can kill it outright, or you can get somebody like me to remove them to a safe place. I have snake tongs and, that I carry with me everywhere. And when I find a venomous snake that's in a dangerous spot, I catch that snake and I remove it to a place where he's not going to bother anybody. And the ecosystem is better for it in that regards as well. I can honestly say this. I have seen more venomous snake species from more different species than I will say everybody in this room combined. Because I've been all around the place. I've seen snakes uh, in every habitat and venomous snakes in every habitat, including on the other side of the world in Australia, in one of the cobra species, one of the most dangerous snakes on the planet. And so I can actually have a track record of saying that I have snake experience. 
And in all those venomous snakes, there has not been a single case where there was a life threatened that I had to kill that snake. I was able to remove those snakes from various places when they were a, a potential danger, and none of those snakes needed to die. That doesn't mean that it's wrong to kill them in self-defense when you are in a situation that requires it, but it is important to realize that that doesn't happen as often as people think. And there are ways of dealing with animals like this that aren't as big a problem. And so that becomes my point is to find a solution that is the best solution. And if killing them is the best solution in a spot, all right, that's fine. But if there's a better solution, let's take that better solution. So that's my perspective on the snake issue. Not bad. You don't have to like the animals out there. They're doing a job that apparently, if Matthew is right, and I think he is, that God has assigned to that animal in a sin-filled world. Not always pretty, but this is an ugly world that Satan has designed for us, and uh, we need to help those who are helping us. Okay, yes, back there. Do we have a microphone? All right, let's 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 Hello. That up. Thank you. This is from the AV room here, and I uh, thank you for that presentation, uh, Brother Matthew. I... Um, you know, I, I've been learning more about this as I got into gardening the last couple of years, and I've learned this really in the in the insect world. You know, there's so many beneficial insects that will protect your crops. For example, you know, the dragonflies and the ladybugs eating the aphids, yeah. and I've just seen it more and more play out. But I did have a question, and in, uh, I'll just give you a Bible reference, like in the book of First Samuel. Uh, I believe it was First Samuel. First uh, Samuel 17, verses 34 and 30, 33, basically, when, when Saul came to David to go out to war, you know, and uh, how Saul, uh, or David, rather, told him that uh, when he was keeping his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and a lamb to take the flock, he went out and smote him and delivered him, uh, and so on and so forth. Just wondering, would that fall into the uh, self-defense model? You know, because I know there's some people who maybe raise animals for, you know, benefits in the farm and so forth. You know, where was that? Where would that lie? Okay, absolutely. And uh, I didn't deal with that in this program. Um, the book I will be handing out tonight at the end of the program uh, is, it actually includes this as part of what I'm, uh, as part of the book. And so I will give a brief uh, synopsis of that right here. Uh, Self-defense is a completely legitimate principle of the Bible. And it was applied in the Bible in two different uh, categories. It was applied in the example of the, the, the David defending his flocks, not even himself, but defending his flocks from the lion and the bear and killing lethally these animals which were threatening them. And so that was a legitimate self-defense case. It also applied to individual people. When they were attacked by somebody else, they could defend themselves lethally. They could actually, when a person, a brigand, a robber tried to kill you, you could defend yourself and kill that person, and it was legitimate. You were not charged with murder in those types of situations. Also, when the entire uh, nation of Israel was attacked by the uh, Midianites or the uh, you know, Moabites or whatever as a nation, they were able to defend themselves and kill those people which were attacking them. And so none of those uh, cases are, all of those cases are allowed and approved in the Old Testament scripture. And so when we look at self-defense, self-defense is a completely legitimate option for protecting yourself. Now this includes several things. This includes a outright attack. So if a mountain lion is trying to jump on you, which doesn't happen as often as people think, but it does, eventually, it does sometimes happen, you can defend yourself lethally in that individual situation. It also applies to when a termite is eating your home because it's destroying your house, and that's self-defense as well, and you can poison the termite in the foundations and keep them from destroying your house. It also applies to the mouse, which is eating your food supply, coming into your house, eating your, um, your, your, your stores of food. That is also self-defense. And so uh, it, there, again, the, the snake and the hawk and the fox also help us to keep that mouse from coming into our yard and coming into our house, and so that's a beneficial. But if they do come in and make it through, then we, of course, can kill those animals in self-defense. So all of those things are legitimately self-defense, and what you're talking about with the, uh, the insects eating our food as well, all of that is, you know, whether it's, whether the, the food is already prepared in a box in our house and a mouse is eating it, or whether it's growing out in the field, 
field and it's being eaten by the uh, gopher or whatever, we're talking about self-defense. And so all of that is a legitimate thing. So my point with all that is that is all acceptable, but, and here's the key but, it should always be done in the most efficient and the most humane way possible. And that's one thing we don't do very well. We go out and we put out poison in the ground for the gopher, and the gopher then dies, and then the hawk comes along and eats the gopher uh, carcass, and then the hawk dies, and then the scavenging uh, vulture comes along and eats the hawk carcass, and then the vulture dies, and we've caused a massive amount of death from that one killing of the gopher. And that's the not a good way to do it. And so we need to be able to do the most efficient most practical way possible that causes the least amount of damage. And that will vary in each situation and whether or not you use a trap, which is a poison for a rodent, or whether you use a glue trap for that rodent, or whether you use a snap trap for that rodent, or whether you use a live trap for that rodent. All of which are scales on which is worse and which is better and whether or not the live trap will work, and if you just take it a mile away and it comes right back, you haven't solved anything. But if you take it to a place where it's not gonna come back, you've solved your problem. If you put out a glue trap, you have not only killed what you're looking for, but a thousand other different animals which you're not looking for. And I've seen glue traps which are covered with every conceivable type of little insect and lizards stuck to the glue trap, completely immobilized, starving to death. It is, and I spent then hours trying to remove those lizards from the glue trap and get off all the glue off of their bodies after I had taken them off. That is a horrible, horrible way to die. Glue traps should be abolished because they are just the most horrific thing possible. Um, poisons, again, do damage beyond the, uh, the, the rodent if it's eaten by other rodents. And you can also poison your cats and dogs that way as well. So again, you need to find what, is work, what works but also is the least damaging in any given option. And that's where we need to be more educated, finding out the best option for any given thing so that we can do as efficient job of protecting ourselves in the least damaging way possible. And that for me is always that balancing act. And so it's not a matter of a black and white, it's a matter of gray, of which is the least gray, which is the best option for any given situation. And when we do that, we're improving the situation not only for that little creature, which we will kill in a certain way, but we're improving it for our pets and for the wildlife and for ourselves in all different ways as well. So we need to be smarter. Um, there's another thing that, you know, with all the ticks, like I said, a friend, uh, a friend of where we were just staying a couple weeks ago at a church, um, they said, you know, we used to have lots of fireflies in our backyard. We loved the fireflies every year because they always were so beautiful. And uh, then we started spraying for ticks all around the yard, and the fireflies are hardly ever seen anymore. Consequences. There's consequences for actions. And the pesticides we're using these days are effective, and that's the problem. They're so effective that they're killing all the beneficial animals as well as the harmful animals. They're killing the dragonflies and the ladybird beetles and all the different ones which are eating our the, 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 the problems. And so we're actually doing massive damage to the entire ecosystem. And I have an entire other program on that called Without This Animal, You Will Die. Those animals that we have to have in order to be continuing as a species on this planet, there are animals God has made in order to make their, that life possible that God has given to us. And when we destroy those animals, we end up destroying ourselves in the process. And so there's real consequences to not caring what we do and just using the most efficient, uh, most cost effective, the most uh, popular way possible. Roundup on your backyard is gonna give you cancer as well as killing all the animals and plants in the backyard as well. So there's major issues involved here besides just what is the cheapest, what is the most effective, what is the most uh, commonly pushed item out there, and those are what I always say, take a deeper look and find out what really works without doing everything uh, damage in the process. Thank you. Okay, my question is about mushrooms. Mushrooms, I guess that's for me. You said they grow, where they grow, they, there is fungus, and uh, I really don't understand the effects of the fungus. At the same time, I would like to know whether mushrooms are good to eat. Okay, I will, I will answer that. the first half and not give you a great answer on the second half. Um, the first half is what is a fungus really doing? All right, so I showed you those pictures of those white threads kind of through everything. So there's tens of thousands of species of fungus all around the world. And most of them 
look like those white threads. And you, if you are a super specialist, you might be able to identify them based on microscopic information, but it, otherwise you're not gonna ever, ever tell them apart. And those fungus threads are growing through wood, soil, um, through plants, uh, whatever it's, it's designed to function at. And it is basically destroying cells and turning them into nutrients, usually plant cells. And so uh, it's basically those fungal threads are putting out their acid enzyme, and so then that cell of that, of that wood is broken down and turned into something usable that, the, that now is recycled and helps to become beneficial not only to the fungus, but to everything else around it. That is why in areas that if you completely destroy all fungus life, you're not going to actually have any wood decay. And there are places where wood is piled up 10 feet deep because all the fungus has been killed for various reasons. And so when you have the natural breakdown, everything turns to soil and loam and, and becomes the nutrients that the next generation of trees will grow up from. And so that's the way the process is supposed to work. Now the fun mushrooms then, like I said, at their time of year, and it varies for each species, are gonna grow up a colorful, sometimes you know, elaborate shape out of the ground, out of the tree, and then those are gonna dump spores. We were just at a, um, a forest area where these huge bracket shell fungus were just growing out, and each one was about this thick with layer upon layer, and the sun was shining down on it, and as the sun was hitting that area, you could actually see spores by the thousands draining out of it. It's just like pollen falling out of the underside of the bracket fungus. Normally you can't see that because the lighting isn't right or they're too small and there's not enough of them. But this was just showing that here was all of these thousands and this was just in a, you know, a few seconds where you were seeing all this pollen come out, these spores. And then it's gonna drift on the wind and it's gonna land on a new place and it's gonna find that particular wood that it likes to eat and then it's gonna start to grow new tendrils into it and that's how it will continue its existence. And so none of that could have happened in the original garden because nothing was dying, nothing was needing recycling and so it had to have happened after the fall to have all of that created. And so God made this unique creation with nothing else like it. It's not an animal. Some people claim it is. That's total nonsense. It is not at all an animal. And it's not a plant. This is what we thought it was for decades. We thought it was a form of plant. And in the last 30 years, we've realized it's a totally different group than not like anything else. And so it's not an animal. It's not a plant. It is a fungus. And it's only a fungus, and it's not like nothing else. Now, it has nutrients being pulled out of it and it is it, that it's being uh, pulling out of the, the various thing to help it grow and help it continue and then it sends up this thing that's like an apple that's like a pine cone and then we pick some of them and we eat some of them and uh, some of them are deadly poisonous if you eat them you will die it's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, it will kill you. Some of them will make you sick. You'll get your um, stomach upset, you might not be happy for a week, and you'll be fine after you get over it. And some of them are delicious, and some of them are actually you know, hard-sought edibles that are, people search through the entire forest to look for, and then charge you lots of money when you, they put it on your plate. And they're very expensive, and they're delicacies. And there's some I've never even tried because they're too expensive to eat. And so it's like, I don't know what they're like. But uh, I've eaten mushrooms, I've eaten you know, the, the ones you buy in the stores, and I've eaten a few of the wild ones that I know are safe. And there's one, the chicken mushroom, which tastes um, like a you know, vegetarian chicken uh, thing. And it's, ba it's basically, it's, it's an orange rubbery thing that you cut into pieces and put on your bread and it just tastes like chicken. And so it's like, you know, it's called the chicken mushroom. It's, it's not very complicated. And uh, so all of these different things then are edible if they're not poisonous. Now, the second part of your question is, are they good to eat? I am a naturalist, not a nutritionist. I cannot tell you whether they are good to eat. Um, they, uh, people, I know some people who swear that they are, they are useful and, and, and give you good nutrients that you don't get from other things, and others that it's worthless and your, your body doesn't do anything with it. I have no idea, and I will not give you an answer on things I don't know. I will happily give you answer on things that I can prove, and I cannot prove that one way or the other, so I will back off of that question and leave you to find an expert who will tell you what they know. <laughs> I have another um, question for you, Matthew. Okay. Um, first, I want to say to my elder, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yes, that's right. And I don't like rodents at all. 
It, so like snake, what, like what? I don't like rodents. Rodents, yeah. And my, my snakes are always my friend. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> and yes. with that said, I have an animal that's often confused with the rodent that I'm at war with right now. I've declared war as of this morning. <laughs> I've declared war against the groundhogs okay. that live in the shed on the property where I live. Yes. I have put a beautiful, well, I didn't put the raised garden, but I've taken advantage of it, and I have many beautiful plants out there that mm -hmm. apparently are personal favorites of the groundhogs. Yeah. And what's frustrating to me is that clover is supposed to be a favorite of groundhogs. Okay. And they bypass all the beautiful clover in the yard and come to my garden and they decimate my parsley yep. and my lettuces and my carrots, and I am going nuts. So my solution to the problem was because I don't want to kill them, I just want them to stay away from my garden, mm -hmm. is to get fox urine. Okay. My question is this. Yeah. When they are under that shed, mm -hmm. they're not living under that shed, is that correct? Because they tunnel, and yeah. I'm guessing that they have tunnels that lead outside and away from my yard. Yes. So my question was, because I'm, I'm going to get fox urine tomorrow. Yeah. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> and I plan to spray around mm -hmm. their den opening, which yeah. leads to our yard, yeah. and around my beds. And so also using peppermint oil for the insects, mm -hmm. not for the, for the, they're not rodents. and I, I, people think they are, but I know that the groundhogs are not rodents. So um, I want to use peppermint oil in the garden for the bugs. Mm -hmm. I don't want to destroy any beneficial bugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think the peppermint oil will kill them, although I know they have killed some bugs because I've used mm -hmm. it on certain bugs yeah. and it works. Yeah. So I don't want to kill beneficial bugs with the peppermint oil and I don't want to kill because my horror was if I spray the, the fox urine around the den, they'll be under there and they can't get out and they'll die. And I don't okay. want that. Yeah. So <laughs> no. I'm trying to find out, really the question is, if I spray it, will they be able to get out from under that? Absolutely, they oh. will totally get out. It is a repellent, it is not a uh, killer. And so even if they come out right through the area where you've sprayed um, and get covered with it, it's not going to kill them. They'll just have to go clean off. And, you know, so it is a totally, if it works, and I, I'm not going to say it works or not because I haven't used it because I'm from the West. I don't have, you know, wood shucks. Yeah, that's right. And so it's like I, I've heard of that being used, and so I will leave the ones who have had good success with it to testify for it. Um, and, but it's not going to kill anybody, and so it is purely a repellent smell and whatever. So yeah, woodchucks dig holes, they dig burrows, and sometimes extensive, and they can have multiple openings and that sort of thing. And so you know, no matter what you you want to find everywhere where they live and use it in every place like that, and don't worry about using too much, um, because it's like it's, you can't hurt them with it. It's just going to make them if, if it works successfully. It's just going to make them say this place is no good. We're going to go somewhere else. And uh, yes, Delise, what do you have to add? Yeah, we have had that I out west with, with pocket gophers, uh, which are the same as your gophers, different species, but the same principle. And uh, if you insert cat urine and uh, cat uh, you know, feces into the hole where the, uh, um, the, the pocket gophers live, you're not going to have pocket gophers for very long. It doesn't kill them. It, they're going to get out. And uh, in fact, one weird thing was my cat, who you know was wanting to hunt them, he gets frustrated, and so he gets to the hole, and he sits there for a long time, and he reaches his hole down there, and he can't get them. Um, eventually, he gets frustrated enough to just go to the bathroom in the hole, which is you know, uh, you know his way of taking it out on them in the fact that he can't catch them. And whenever that has happened, those uh, areas have been depopulated of, of gophers. They go to other places. So we know it works. It's an effective uh, uh, you know, eradication of that, moving to other places. And we didn't even have a reason to get rid of the gophers. I like them. You know, they don't, we didn't have a garden, so it's not a big deal for us. You know, so we weren't trying to get rid of them, but the cat got rid of them for us. And without catching a one, he, he was so incompetent at catching them that he never caught any, but he managed to get rid of them anyway, non-lethally. So he was all good. 
Um, but uh, yeah, um, and the peppermint oil, I have heard that as well, that it is successful and uh, it does, what it basically does is it melts their uh, chitin on their, on their, I mean, on their, not the chitin, but their exoskeleton and uh, will damage them to the point of, of uh, killing them, stuff like that. So you don't want to actually spray it on a ladybug, but in, you know, you do want to get it on the ones which are causing you problems because it will have an effect on all the insects. That's right. That's right. And then whatever is coming for those will be bothered by it and not, not so yeah. And that's the point. There are other methods than using the neonicotinoid poisons and using the various things that are out there which are going to do damage to everybody in the process. So yeah, absolutely find the most uh, um, uh, effective, least damaging thing. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, woodchucks are a form of rodent. They're a big form of rodent. And so they're like, you know, it's like you got beavers and capybaras are the big ones, and you know, you get down to the tiniest little mice, they're all rodents. And so, yeah, yep. Uh, uh, marmots. Yeah. Yeah, the marmot is actually it's a it's a part of the rodent family. And now there's it's not a part of the rat family. It's not part of the mouse family. There's there's whole bunches of different, you know, a beaver is not a mouse, but it is a rodent. And so, you know, it's a huge in fact it's the rodents are the biggest family of mammals on planet Earth. There's so, there's so much variety in them. And so when we think so think of rats and mice, you know, that's a group of rodents, but there's other groups and 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 the woodchucks are one of those other groups. They are related to the marmots out west and what's interesting is that here in the east you have one species and that is the woodchuck it lives in your yard it lives in lawns it lives in fields out west they do not do that they live up in the mountains where people aren't and they live up in mountain meadows and they don't bother people at all and so they they're basically the same animal with totally different behavior and so the one that causes us problems is the one in the east the one out west doesn't do any of those things at all and so it's kind of an unusual, strange thing that their behavior is quite so different, even though they're virtually the same type of animal. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, my um, question is um, pertaining to the thir three angels message. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would like- I thought I was gonna have a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Amen. Yes, um, so um, my question is, um, the third angel's message message is supposed to swell into a loud cry. And I wanted to know when given the message, will we be given the loud cry now? And um, will we ever give the fourth angel's message? And when we do give the third three angels message, do we give them all together or separately? All right, good point. Um, what we have here is very clearly expressed by Ellen White during the time of Jones and Wagoner. She said that was the beginning of the loud cry. So the message of righteousness by faith, preparing characters ready for the seal of God, that is the message of the loud cry. The, uh, the, um, the latter rain does two things, basically. It, number one, prepares us to give the loud cry, so we have the strength and the ability and the Holy Spirit's guidance to do that, but it also prepares us spiritually for the Battle of Armageddon, because we are going into the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And to be able to stand up against Satan's deceptions, we are not smart enough to figure out his deceptions. And so it's going to toughen us up, get us ready, a little time of trouble, which is going to be a time of trouble to prepare us for the final great disaster that's going to come upon this earth when the angels let the winds go. So the bottom line in all of this is that the three angels' messages are one unit. They are not one, two, then three. They are one unit of messages to prepare the world to not receive the mark of the beast and be destroyed. They are one basic message. In fact, you often find Ellen White referring to the third angel's message. That's code word for three angels' messages in her writings. Third angel, three angel. And so um, um, the, the, the sealing work takes place during the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in which God's people are sealed, ready to go to battle, ready to live without an intercessor in the, in the heavenly sanctuary, 
ready to demonstrate God's power over Satan. Uh, and that takes place during the time of the latter reign. And that takes place also during the time when laws will be enacted. Uh, rather than separating this thing and then that thing and then the other thing happening, these are be, will be happening all virtually at the same time period. Laws will be passed that will restrict our liberties. Uh, there will be a number of Sunday laws you can live with. Are you aware of that? Uh, you don't have to uh, be, you will not be persecuted under local Sunday laws, most likely, because you can, you can simply refrain from working in your yard uh, on, on Sunday. You can hold uh, Bible studies. You can do other things. Ellen White told us how we could relate to Sunday laws when they're passed. And sometimes we get all up in arms and say, well, I'm going to demonstrate the fact that I will reject Sunday by going out and mowing my lawn every Sunday. Well, that's not good counsel. That's not wise, because Ellen White said, we do not bring a time of trouble on us. Let, the, let it be placed on us. We don't uh, produce that. So there will be Sunday laws passed that are livable, not convenient, but livable. Uh, when the stores begin to close on Sunday and you can't get what you need, well, just do it on Monday. Uh, so there will be laws like that that will, will make it more difficult to actually uh, carry out our, our lifestyle, but are livable. And during that period of time, God is going to be sending his Holy Spirit in the latter rain to prepare us for when the death decree is passed upon us, which is after the close of probation, by the way. The death decree for all Sabbath keepers does not occur until about the second plague in that area. So that's what I understand about the whole picture. All right. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Um, this, this question is for Matthew. Um, All right. Good enough. Um, <clears throat> yeah. W when I was listening to the program, uh, I mean, um, just a while ago, mm -hmm. and you talked about the animals, I was thinking about the wild boars that uh, are running around all these states. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just recently a lady told me she saw one nearby my property in Tennessee. So um, <coughs> it's a twofold question. Well, I, I don't particularly like to shoot the animals, but, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to be lunch for them either. So, uh, but like a wild boar. <laughs> so, you know, I've, you know, we have had foxes eat our chickens, and then we got a couple of dogs that yeah. actually one year we lost seven chickens, this year we lose one because the dog probably was on the other side. So, mm -hmm. you know, that to me is a way of keeping the, some of the animals away from your chickens because yeah. we don't eat eggs or we, we actually feed them to the, feed the, ch the eggs to the dog and, or give it to people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but, but, you know, the issue of the wild boar, I, I see it as something what you were talking about because mm -hmm. look how it's taking over and causing decimation in a lot of crops. Because, you know, we do farming, so I'm wondering because, you know, I don't want to be, it's, it's hard enough to grow something and then for a wild animal to yeah. eat it. So that's one of the reasons why I said, look, I want to shoot something because mm -hmm. I don't, I know, I'm not gardening out there for weeks and then these animals come and eat my stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I'll sleep out there and shoot them. I ain't not playing <laughs> that. But so, you know, so if you understand, it, yes, there's two things. It's either you... You, you use guns in, in an instance when you have to use it, mm -hmm. and then also you use animals to, like dogs, to protect your, your, your stuff. Yeah. So okay. uh, what, what do you think about that? All right, <clears throat> so uh, here's the, you know, the first part of this is uh, wild boar are non-native to Eastern North America. They are not part of the regular ecosystem that uh, we found when we came to America. We brought pigs with us. And then we released them, and we brought these wild boars from Europe. And uh, then we domesticated pigs, um, released, and they bred with these uh, European boars. So the wild pigs in throughout the United States are a mixture of domestic pigs and European wild boars. And some have more wild boar in them, and some have more domestic pig in them, but they're all these various combinations of, of uh, those two groups of animals. And so they go around in the uh, woods and they 
uproot uh, a lot of uh, plants, and then they come into your backyard and they uproot your crops and your garden and things like that, and so they do damage to where they are. Um, in certain areas, they live in this, in the, they like swamps, um, you know, they like uh, a lot of swampy areas. We were just at Congaree National Park in South Carolina, which is a huge uh, wetland swamp area. And uh, we found a mother wild boar and two piglets uh, running through the woods, and they were having a great time in that habitat. Um, in those type of habitats, they're not doing much damage in terms of, you know, the ecosystem damage. They're just another animal who eats uh, various things and uproots things, and it's, you know, not much different than um, other animals doing their particular things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not as bad in those types of wild situations where in the, they're in remote areas um, doing their thing, and I don't object to them in those type of habitats. Uh, but obviously, when you deal with now in your backyard, you don't want them eating your food and that sort of thing. So again, now that is a self-defense issue that comes into this area of how we can defend ourselves. And again, what's the most effective way to do so? Is getting a guard dog that is trained to repel wild animals, and there are certain ones that do that. Um, there's, that's actually the most beneficial thing out west to keep a uh, wolf from coming around and bothering your, you know, domestic pets or your livestock or whatever is actually dogs, not, uh, you know, anything else. And so dogs that are trained properly to do that are very effective in chasing them away. And so th most of these pigs, when you see them, are going to turn and run the other direction. I've seen wild boar all through the United States, and every time I've seen them, the entire herd picks up and screams and runs the opposite direction. Um, however, a big female defending her babies or a big male with the big tusks on him who is ornery will not do that and they will defend themselves and be aggressive and especially if you come after them you know to try and do them damage they're totally going to defend themselves and they can effectively do so and so again they become in that case a more dangerous animal most of the time not but sometimes yes and so again, all right, so now we go out and shoot them. And so now you, you get the satisfaction of reducing that animal from a threat to a dead animal. Um, the problem is, is that behind him is his neighbor that's gonna take his place. So you can keep killing them and you can keep killing them and it's not going to actually eliminate the problem. You're just gonna have a new pig who will take their place because there's a vacuum. As long as the food source is there, the pigs are gonna keep coming. And this is the problem with all of the management efforts by game agencies, and you know, I was talking about the deer, is that they are not trying to eliminate these animals. They don't want to eliminate the deer, they don't want to eliminate the pigs, they want them as a continuing source of revenue for their state game agencies because the more hunting opportunities possible as a commercial thing, the more money that comes in through licensing fees, through ammunition, through gun sales, through all of that kind of stuff into the industry. So the industry of sport hunting has no interest in getting rid of the animals that it is hunting. And so in many places where pigs could be eliminated from an area completely by certain methods which would actually go out there and destroy the entire um, herd of pigs that is not allowed by the state game agencies because they want the hunting to continue. So you're going out and killing them in your backyard um, even though effective for five minutes will not solve the problem because the resource of the continuing pig population is going to keep coming no matter what. So the, pop, the options are to find something that will actually protect your crops from the uh, particular um, problem that the, the pigs represent. Um, dogs are an option. Um, a really strong fence that a pig is not going to be able to dig under or break through is another option. It's going to be more than a deer fence, which, you know, is to be, you know, they're strong animals and they can punch through a lot of stuff. And depending on how big your area is, that, is, that may be completely cost ineffective. And so that becomes, again, you know, is there a way of dealing with this um, cost effectively and, and humanely or not? And if not, all right, so then you kill the pig. But again, I'm afraid it's not going to solve your problem because there's 20 more pigs behind him in a row waiting to take his place. And uh, so, you know, again, um, that's a tough one. It's a, it is a tough one. I, I don't, I'm not saying this is an easy answer because the system that we live in will never allow those pigs to be gotten rid of. Um, the system wants those pigs to be continue to be available, so they're going to keep them going, and you're the one who's going to suffer the consequences for that. 
Um, and so again, <clears throat> the and this is the problem with deer hunting in you know um, in a si situation where you know people have a property that is being uh, uh, harassed by deer, and you go out and you shoot all the deer, or you go out and you have somebody else shoot the deer for you. It doesn't matter. The problem is is that the deer herd is a thousand strong, waiting to fill that vacuum. As soon as those deer are gone, they're going to be replaced by new deer. And so it's not going to be solved by weaponry, is, is my point. It will, it will feel good because you got rid of that bugger that was eating your thing, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of buggers waiting to take his place, and so you're not going to get a, a permanent solution to it. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that there exists a permanent solution in our corrupt system that puts uh, money over actual... Uh, protection of resources and different things like that. And so I, it's, it's not an easy answer for those type of things, both the deer eating crops and pigs doing different things like that. I don't object to the pigs as being as invasive because, again, uh, prehistorically, there were pigs in America. Um, they went extinct um, about 3,000 years ago, um, but there were pigs, and there were big pigs in America. So it's not like there have never been pigs here, and so it's like not an ecosystem animal. Um, it's just an animal that is now here, and it's doing certain beneficial things, mostly negative things, and causing problems. So again, um, I don't envy you your problems, um, and there's no um, silver bullet solution to them. Um, I honestly would favor the dog solution uh, if, as, as something that would actually be a long-term effective thing. You know, you have them protecting chickens. If you have a dog that is trained, and I'm sure there are people who have done this, uh, trained to smell pigs and, and chase them off, uh, the trouble with that, again, is that a big pig can face off with a big dog, and it's not as easy as driving away a skunk or a, um, a raccoon or something like that, um, because they're a big animal that a dog has to be able to deal with, and will the pig back away? Most will, not all. And so I'm not going to give you a great answer here. I'm just spelling out all the uh, issues involved, and you have to go from there and figure out what works for you and what, what, what doesn't. All right? Bunnies, cute little bunnies. <laughs> I know, that's right. And uh, again, the reason there's so many bunnies is because there aren't enough predators. That is a, that is a reality. That they're, uh, sure, get some snakes, get some foxes, get some, uh, you know, some guys, uh, hawks. You know, all of these guys are, are actually what kept the bunny population in check. And there's a lot more bunnies than there used to be, just like the deer. And uh, that is a factor of reducing predator populations, prey populations go up and causes problems. So that is exactly what I was talking about. And so the bunnies are adorably cute and cause a lot of problems. And I mean, we can list a whole bunch of cute animals which causes problems. So it's like that is a real issue. And so again, um, the system is, is such that until the predators come back to full strength, which is not liable to happen tomorrow, um, these animals are going to be at abnormally high populations causing problems. And again, all right, so you go out there and you shoot the bunny. Well, there's another thousand bunnies waiting behind him. And so it's exactly, the principle is the same with all of these different animals. And so you have to find a way of fencing off your garden that the bunny is not going to get through. And so is that easy? No, but that's where we're at. And it's like, it's, it's all, of the, all of these animals are the same issue. Everything that's coming into our yard and eating our food, if the system was working properly, that would happen far less than it does. And because of our anti-predator agenda, it happens much more frequently than it should. Okay, uh, ticks are uh, I, uh, a, a major issue. I have a, I have a personal hatred of ticks. I, I hate very few animals. I hate ticks. Um, they're always, because they're everywhere where I go. I'm always out hiking in the woods. I'm always getting ticks crawling on me. It's not fun. And um, so I consider a nice week to be a tick-free tick week that I've only had two or three ticks on my legs. You know, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a fun week, you know, in the East. And um, I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I've been to every state in the United States. The worst areas are the east. The worst areas are the south. The southeast areas of, the, of this United States are the worst tick areas uh, possible. And that is twofold. Number one, the deer population. 
the deer population is a carrier of a huge number of ticks, and the deer population, exactly what I've been talking about here, boosted artificially by the sport hunting industry, has boosted tick populations exponentially, far more than they should be. I mean, you do not read about people in the 1800s talking about 100 ticks crawling up their leg when they stepped into a nest. You don't read about that. I, I've read about Mark Twain when he uh, was excited because uh, in, in Huckleberry Finn, in the Huck Finn, uh, it was excited because the, the first really good wood tick of the season had shown up, and it was an, like an event. And he was playing with his wood tick, and you know he was all excited with his wood tick. You know, I mean that was that was it was it was something that happened, but it wasn't happening every five minutes. And we now have ticks everywhere, all the time, attacking us all the time. And a bunch of them have Lyme disease, and others have other weird diseases and things like this. Um, again, <clears throat> the best methods of control are those animals which are eating the rodents and, and that sort of thing. So it's like the, the snakes are doing it, the uh, hawks are, are, are doing it. The, all the predators which are eating rodents are helping to reduce the tick population, and when those go away, the tick population is boosted. So that is part of what I was talking about here in this program. The next issue is the fact that temperature changes have now allowed ticks to spread into areas that they were uh, previously were excluded from. And so they're actually spreading because of rising temperatures into areas both up mountains and farther north and farther west into places that they didn't reach before. So again, because of alteration of our uh, ecosystem habitat, we're actually increasingly seeing uh, numbers of ticks. So the best population control for ticks is the predators. That is the best thing. Secondary thing is personal protection so that when you go out, you're protected from ticks or clean them off as soon as possible. Because the ticks are repelled by certain things, and DEET is the most famous because it's the most effective, but it's also the most toxic. It's bad for your skin, it's bad for the animals, you know, it's, so it's like it's a bad thing, but it does keep the ticks off. So if you judiciously use it when you go out into places that uh, put it on, you can, you can actually repel the ticks. Also, there are other non-DEET ones which are effective against ticks, and those are what I tend to use more than the DEET. I try to avoid DEET as possible, but there's others which aren't quite as toxic but are just as effective in getting rid of them and do so. So I try and find those type of things when I'm going out into a place I know is full of ticks. But again, it's still poisons, but you know, you want to use them as little as possible, use them effectively. Um, and again, like I said, that person that we were just at, they are spraying for ticks and they're effectively killing the ticks, but they're killing everything else in the process as well. And when we lose the pollinators and the animals and the insects which are decomposing our waste products and those which are predatorily helping us by like lady beetles, we're doing much more damage to ourselves than just reducing the ticks. And so when we, yes, we're reducing the tick, but we're also reducing all these beneficial insects and the benefits from losing the ticks and those are not equal. We're actually doing more damage to ourselves than just with the ticks. So again, it's one of those things where the knee-jerk reaction is to go out and spray everything and kill everything, get rid of all the mosquitoes and all this sort of thing, but in the process, we're actually damaging ourselves more than we realize by doing all the different damages like that. So again, personal protection is what I most recommend and allowing the predators to do their job and help us in getting rid of the tick populations. Yes? Back there? Yeah. Just since we're talking about insects, I just wanted to make a quick comment which I apologize, I don't have the source, but we can all go out and research it, and I'll try to see if I can get it from my sister-in-law. But in terms of plants, uh, I mean insects in our own gardens, um, when I was visiting with her, she was watching this video where there's this expert on soil health as well as which insects will attack your garden mm -hmm. depending on the, so the health of your soil. Mm -hmm. And as you improve it, like every grade up, like one class of insects will fall away, they're not interested anymore, and another one is. So it's almost like, oh, rejoice that the aphids are here now, because that means yes. <laughs> it's a clear sign you've improved your soil. Yes. So you just, you wanna keep going through all the levels, but I just wanted to mention that as like a natural way. You might see insects and you're like, let me figure out all the natural ways to kill them, mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, that's just a sign that the pH of my soil is off yeah. and I really need to invest yeah. 
that's in, right. in that way. So that's, I just wanted to share that as that's well. That's brilliant, and that's exactly what I'm talking about, finding the deeper cause of things and actually the beneficial things of things happening, which we don't usually um, t take a look at because we're always about, oh, there's an aphid on my rose. I must now spray everything in sight. No, the, you're, you're exactly right. Look at the deeper thing, and that's a, that would be a really useful chart to make available to people because that is something that uh, most people don't even realize how, you know, it, it's a sign of a benefit, not a sign of a problem. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Yeah, I do have a question for Pastor Preby. Okay. So the question is from online and it says, please explain in detail the man in Roman chapter 7 verse 15 and the transformation of the man in Philippians 2 chapter ch Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 okay yeah that, that and so you're asking what makes the transfer or what are you asking exactly uh, the person was asking to explain the um, in detail the man so both in Roman chapter 7 verse 15 and the transformation that happens in Philippi Philippians 2:13 an online question, very good. All right, in Romans 7, uh, and the verse was specifically which one, or do you know? 15. 15. Uh, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. That is the expression of the natural state of fallen nature. Fallen nature wants to do better, but it doesn't. It wants to make improvements, but it wants its own pleasures too. And so the fallen nature is described in chapter 7, verse 15. The battle between what we know is good for us and what we want to do. That's human fallen nature at its most, ne most normal expression. From babyhood on, it, this, is, this is the description of what we are. So that is just the way we are by nature. Philippians chapter 2 verse which again? 13. 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right, you are talking in, in Romans 7 about the natural man. You are talking about the spiritual man in Philippians 2. Uh, that was our subject for last night for those of you who weren't here. The one is the way we are born naturally. We are not sinners, but we are, have all kinds of problems because of a fallen human nature. The one in Philippians 2 is what happens when we allow God to do his work in us. And this is, this is what happens after the new birth. We ask God to give us uh, better thinking abilities, better choosing capabilities, and then power to carry out those capabilities. So one is natural, one is spiritual. One is normal to human beings, one is a divine supernatural act of God. Thank All you. All right, now it is 6.30, and uh, we are scheduled to start our next meeting at 6.30. Is there another question that needs to be handled? I see over here, yes, go ahead. Yes, no problem. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Elder Preby, and I know, you know, it's kind of, um, it's a little bit of Adventist history here, but could you go into any of your experience of working with um, Pastor Ron Spears? I saw a video, uh, and he said that you guys were good friends, and he really appreciates your ministry. Ah, uh, yes, Elder Ron Spear. Him uh, and the Standish Brothers. And the Standish Brothers, that's right. We have none of them anymore. You're aware of that? Uh, and so I, I consider them good friends. In fact, Ron Spear was, after I left employment at Pacific Union College, Ron Spear was the first self-supporting ministry I checked out uh, to see what they were doing up there in, uh, in Washington. And uh, so I visited there, then I visited a number of other places, uh, self-supporting work, uh, to see what was going on. All right. So uh, all of this is that these individuals, the Standish brothers, Ron Spear, and, uh, and others besides, uh, they were not the only ones, but these are the ones which were holding the line most strongly against the inroads of evangelical theology. 
The little magazine, Our Firm Foundation, printed for many years. Maybe it's still going, but uh, it's the new people now. Uh, the firm, Our Firm Foundation was a s real bastion of good, s good, sound biblical theology in relation to us today. So I would consider those individuals as heroes of faith. That's my evaluation Amen. of all of those three individuals. They did their job for God. God laid them to rest because they had apparently finished the work God had assigned them to do, as could happen to any one of us as well. Uh, we're, we're, we're used by God as long as he sees fit to use us. And when he lays us to rest, we praise his name because we are ready for, uh, for the resurrection. Those are all areas in which I miss their messages. I wish they were still here. Uh, uh, they can't be. And so we, we move on. Uh, but we move on in harmony with their warnings and their counsel. The books written by Colin and Russell Standish are among the very best books uh, showing how a new theology came into Adventism that we had never seen before in Adventism. It had always been there outside Adventism, but now it was deep inside Adventism. So that's my relationship to those men. I worked with them in later meetings around the country, uh, and I was pleased to be a part of their fellowship. Amen. All right. Um, Elder Brewery, we have another question. Um, where does this come back? Okay. Yeah, back AV there. room. Uh, the question is right, in hold on. Wait, before we get into that, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, as growing up as a young Adventist and when my father started traveling, I started meeting all of these people as we went around the country, you know, Joe Cruz and, and uh, Ron Spear and all these guys. And uh, all of them, I have to say that the Standish brothers were some of my favorite people that I ever met in all of our speaking interactions, whatever. Um, they were godly men, friendly, friendly, supportive. Yeah. You know, they were people who were just... You know, they, they took an interest in your interests, and they were, but they were at the same time stalwart, strong for the truth, no compromise over true issues. And so I wanted to just, you know, especially, I mean, Ron was too, but I never got as friends with him as I did with, with uh, Colin and Russell. And uh, they were just fantastic people for, for the Lord. I'll tell you a brief, you know, little anecdote about them that you will never have heard because this kind of conversation doesn't come up with most people. Um, because when I was at that age, you know, a teenager just kind of learning what was going on in the world with animals and different things like that. And I was at that point very um, upset by what I was seeing with the uh, torture of fish for sport fishing. And because the fish are feeling pain and all that kind of stuff. And so I, you know, I, I was at that point very formulating my ideas about what was right and wrong to do to animals. And I talked to them about it at that time, and the Colin. Uh, Colin, well, Colin and Russell, they were both there as we were heading to somewhere. And Colin, he says, you know, because they, you know, Heartland at that time, I don't know if it's still true, I hope it is, would not allow any fishing in its ponds because of the cruelty involved. And uh, so the, uh, I talked to them, and, and, and he says, yes, and, you know, he has this big voice, you know, and, and Colin is going, yeah, so it is a terrible thing because they feel pain like everybody else, and they should not be tortured for our fun. And he goes on and on and on with all of this sort of information that he is, you know, agreeing with what I'm learning. And, you know, it was a perfect example of the difference between the twin brothers because after that long description intellectually you know a sound description of why fishing was wrong afterward then his brother basically summed it up fishing is a blood sport and that was all he had to say about it and it was like you know colin is the uh, calm reasoning one and his brother is the fire and brimstone one and it was just a perfect example of how those two were both a hundred percent on fire and on track but in their own different way and i love that about both of them and have you ever heard that Joe Cruz is a hard-nosed, hard rigid guy that you would not want to be around? Big lie. Boy, he was the easiest person to talk to in the world. All right, now your question. Oh, uh, the question is, in light of the need to have victory over sin, it's said that there is a separate clause of probation for the SDA church. Is this true? All right. No, it's not true. Here is what I understand from everything I've been able to find about close of probation. There is only one time that Michael stands up in Scripture, Daniel 12.1. And he stands up and probation is closed. So what does that mean? That means that the last person 
who has yet to decide about God and Satan has made his or her final decision. God is going to close probation when each individual has a full understanding of what it is to serve God or to serve Satan, and we are closing probations as we speak in the world today. I mean, Judas closed his probation, didn't he? And others have been closing their probation down the line. And so, the, but it, in, in the end time, it's going to be due to some very strict laws that are passed that are going to encourage people to go one way or the other right now. And uh, probations will be closed. What will happen? What will happen is Ezekiel 8 and 9 describe that where the destroying angels will start is at the temple of God. Those who have had great light will be the first to feel the wrath that is coming down upon, uh, upon those who have misled so many people in tragic ways and have had the, the responsibility of leading people. The last thing I want to be and when Jesus comes is one of those ministers that they will turn to and say, you didn't warn us. You didn't tell us. You, you could have shared with us what you knew. That's the last thing I want to be at that time period. And so all of these are evidences that God is leading people step by step, and he will be, people will be closing their own probations by final decisions and when the last one makes that decision. So yes and no to that question. No separate close of probation for the Seventh-day Adventist Church corporately. Closing of probation for individuals as they are making final choices, definitely. And those who are in responsible leadership positions most clearly will be closing their probations earlier. I hope that helps. Thank you. Now, it is um, quarter to seven. We used up 10 more minutes. So what I'm asking right now, and I'm gonna ask for counsel, is Brother, Brother Roberts right here. What should we do at this point? Uh, I have one more presentation. Probably will only last around a half hour to 35 minutes. Okay, that, that was perfect. So what we're gonna do right now, let's take a little break. We do have some watermelon um, in the kitchen area so that we can, watermelon cantaloupe, and we are going to really try to get back here for seven, okay? And so from seven, we have another hour and a half or so before the sun is down, so we'll just give the rest of the time between Matthew and um, Dr. Preeby. And again, remember that after they are through, that they are going to have some materials for sale, okay? All right, so let's dismiss at this time, and. Um, as I said, we do have some melon in the kitchen area there. Let's do that right now. All I would add to that is it's easy to get into conversations that last half an hour when you thought you were going for 15 minutes. So let's try to get back here at 7.
do what works without just saying, well, try this, try this, try this, because
the high priest up in heaven. Hallelujah, oh hallelujah, he's our defender for the Father in a temple made by God, not man, behind the veil, in a place most holy, hallelujah, oh hallelujah, investigating, he clears the Blotting out my sin in the sanctuary. He seals my bond with him in the sanctuary up in heaven. He makes provision for me in the sanctuary he's purifying heaven's temple hallelujah oh hallelujah in preparation for his returning for those who love and follow him he's blotting out my sin in the sanctuary he seals my sanctuary up in heaven he makes provision for me in the sanctuary at the mercy seat in the holy of holies in the holy Anyone within the hearing of my voice, we are going to start. It is now five minutes after seven, and I want to uh, uh, move ahead as rapidly as I can. As much as I'm enjoying the good music along with you, I promise to get started as close to seven as possible. So uh, we're going to go ahead and hope that people will filter in if they are still outside. Again, let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, for one more hour, may your Holy Spirit guide everything that we do and say and think. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, quiz time. God loves me only if I'm good. 
God loves me when I overcome temptation. God doesn't love me, nor does he care. God loves me all the time. Okay, that was an easy quiz, wasn't it? But here's the problem. Sometimes we forget that the majority of those that God loves will be outside the city at the very end of this earth's history, outside the New Jerusalem. So God's loving us is not the answer to our salvation. He loves us even when we're rebelling against him, but that doesn't save us. Perhaps far more important for us is a different aspect of God. Would you take your Bible and look up with me 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 7. Art thou, are not thou our God, who, did dry, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? Did you catch anything interesting in that description of Abraham? What is he called? Thy friend. God's friend. God's friend. That's an interesting description. In Christianity, it is appropriate to ask, uh, how's your relationship with God? That's correct, no problem with that. But scripture teaches that there is something even more than that, than just a sovereign and subject. Abraham was a friend of God. Not just a good subject, not just a good citizen, but an actual friend of God. Well, let's look up another one, Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. And verse 11, Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Another individual who is called a friend of God. We need to be friends of God, don't we? All right. Uh, turn with me to John. Uh, the, yes, John chapter 14, 15, I'm sorry. John chapter 15. John chapter 15, verse 14. Ye are my friends if, what's the if next? Ye do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So not only Moses, not only um, um, Abraham, but you and I can be friends of God if we do what he asks us to do. So what is that? I think it's crucial for us to be a friend of God. We need to have that experience with him. In fact, isn't the judgment that is going on right now to determine who wants to be friends with God for the rest of eternity? Isn't that what God is trying to determine? Who would like to be around him? Who would find it distasteful to be around him? He won't make them serve in, in heaven. So the whole judgment thing that's going on is who are the friends of God? Now what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to get very direct. I have been uh, direct with you before in this church, and I'm going to do it again. Um, Thirty years ago, Morris Venden wrote a book 95 Theses on Righteousness by Faith, Apologies to Martin Luther. Okay. The way to become friends with God, my friends, is through the process of righteousness by faith, but the problem is that today people have widely divergent views of what righteousness by faith is and how it works. So that ordinary Christians like you and me can become very confused about righteousness by faith. So I'm going to go through some of these theses on righteousness by faith. 
And most of the statements, I'll just tell you this up front, are reasonable and Bible-based. And I have no problem in, I have no problem with them whatsoever. But in significant areas, these theses lead to confusion and a distorted view of righteousness by faith. And I'm going to pick those out this afternoon and share with you why. Thesis, thesis number four, 95 theses, remember. Christianity and salvation are based not on what you do, but on whom you know. Well, that's partially correct, but not totally. Number seven. Our good works are not what cause us to be saved. Our bad works are not what cause us to be lost. All right, let's go to the book of James. Our good works are not what cause us to be saved. Our bad works are not what cause us to be lost. James chapter 1. Let's go to God's word. James chapter 1. And I'm going to read verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Check out chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? Verse 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Verse 24, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Well, our good works are not what cause us to be saved. Our bad works are not what cause us to be lost. Something doesn't fit there. Good works, good works. You have to make a distinction between human works and good works. Human works is what I can do all by myself. A natural person can do human works. Good works <clears throat> is always loving obedience to God, always loving obedience to God, always connected with genuine faith. There is no true faith without obedient works. So it's a little uh, confusing to say our good works are not what cause us to be saved, our bad works are not what cause us to be lost. Okay, next one. Everyone is born sinful because everyone is born separated from God. There is a big one. Let me read that again. Everyone is born sinful because everyone is born separated from God. Let's go back to the book of Psalms to check out that one. Psalm. 71, Psalm 71, and verse 6. Remember the, the thesis. We are all born separated from God. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. Does that sound like we're separated from God at birth? Not quite, I don't think. Um, let's go a little farther. Chapter 22 of Psalms. Psalm 22, verse 9. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. I think we have a problem here. How can you be born separated from God and God with you from your birth, from the very moment of your birth? So being separated is just another way to say that we're born sinners. We're all born sinners because we're born separated from God, under condemnation because we are in the family of Adam. My friends, that is Catholic original sin. That is not an Adventist doctrine. That is brought to us from Catholicism to through Protestantism, through Luther and Calvin, to us today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that is a major problem. Everyone is born separated from God. 
Okay, another one, number 10. We sin because, uh, because we are sinful. We are not sinful because we sin. All right, let me say that again so you catch it. We sin because we are sinful. We are not sinful because we sin. Let's check it out. You know, when you have a, a, a statement, you need to check it out from Scripture, don't you? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59. Now, the question is, what separates us from God? Birth or something else? But your, in Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So what separates us from God? Our sins, our choices to sin. There's another one in 1 John chapter 3. If you, don't, if you don't have time to look up all of these, you can write them down and check them out later. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Nine times Ellen White says that is the only definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. So it is sin that separates, willful transgression of the law that separates us from God. We are sinners because we sin. We are not sinning, uh, so let me get this right. We are sinners because we sin. We do not sin because we are sinners. This thesis is dead wrong. We are not sinners because Adam sinned. We have a sinful nature, of course we do. We have a, a bad world to live in, but we are not Sinning, we are not, uh, we, <laughs> let's be sure we get this right every time we say it. We are not condemned by God because Adam sinned. That's original sin, which is a Catholic doctrine. All right, let's see what else we have here. Sin, living apart from God, results in sins, doing wrong things. So living apart from God results in doing wrong things. Let's make sure we have this right. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So he that committeth sin, that is the only way you can be of the devil, not by birth. So committing sin, doing wrong things, results in living apart from God, not the opposite way around. You are not apart from God, therefore you sin. These theses that I'm reading to you right here take the responsibility for sinning away from us and we put it on Adam's shoulder. We got a bad birth. We got a bad nature. It's Adam's fault. I can't be responsible for losing my temper. It's just the way I was made since Adam sinned for us. It places the blame on our birth state, not our choices. All right, moving on in some of these theses. I'm going to read a few to you. We give up our power of choice toward behavior. We keep our power of choice toward relationship. Let's think about that one. We give up our power of choice toward behavior. We keep our power of choice toward relationship. James chapter 2, back to where we were in the book of James. Let's see what we can find. James chapter 2. Verses 18 and 20. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 20. Wilt thou know, O vain, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? So separating behavior from relationship is separating works from faith. In other words, you can have a faith relationship with God even though your works are no good. That's what is being told to us. And this disconnects our choice of actions from believing in Christ. 
It says you can believe in Christ and be right with him even though your actions are not good. Let me read the statement again from the thesis. Sin, living apart from God, results in sins doing wrong things. No, it's just the opposite. Doing wrong things causes us to live apart from God. Doing wrong things separates us from God. Original sin has been coming into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in full force over the last 50 years. I can point you, and I'm not going to take any time to do that today, I can point you to a number of speakers that you enjoy listening to, that you really are benefited by, that you say, I'm glad they're saying these important things, who believe in original sin today. It is affecting and infecting even the most faithful among us. And uh, we're now just succumbing to the fact that everyone is born a sinner because that's the way it is. All right, another one. The only deliberate effort in living the Christian life is in seeking God. Spontaneous effort toward other things will result. So you make your effort is seeking God and then other things, your obedience will be spontaneously effective. Let's stay in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Does that sound like a spontaneous? Just happens automatically? It says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Go back to 1 Peter, since we're right here. Uh, 1 Peter, chapter 1. No, nope. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Are we to simply say, well, God will take care of that. Uh, I believe in God. Uh, I, I'm in a right relationship with him. It'll all work out easily. So we have a problem there. While seeking God must be our first priority, yes it is. We must seek God, that's our bottom line. It is not true that obedient behavior will spontaneously be the result of that. It'll just happen. There must be a conscious effort to resist Satan's temptations. There has to be that kind of effort if we're going to have victory. All right, let's see what else we find. These are part of the 95 Theses on Righteousness by Faith. Growing Christians experience on-again, off-again surrender. Sometimes they depend on God, and sometimes they depend on themselves. Okay, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. You know, Brother Venden was right in that growing Christians experience on again, off again surrender. But is that the way it's supposed to be? Is that the normal thing? Not according to what I just read here, being made free from sin. And then one more time back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. 1 John 3 is a powerful chapter to refute some of these things. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit seed, sin. For his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. These are strong texts here that we have to come to grips with, see what God is really trying to say to us. So, yes, Christians do not always depend on God, but this thesis makes it sound like that's normal. Sometimes you depend on God, sometimes you know, you don't. That's the best we can hope for as growing Christians. Intermittent surrender. And that's a devastating travesty, I think, on righteousness by faith. Going way over, and I'm not going to share many of these with you, just a few. 
Anyone who gets discouraged with his relationship because of his behavior is a legalist. Anyone who gets discouraged with his relationship because of his behavior is a legalist. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter 13. Hope we can take time to think to look these texts up and think about them a little later. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Examine yourselves to know if you're in the faith. Are you supposed to just, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, my behavior isn't so good, but that's the way it is. I don't think that's good. So here again, we have a separation between a saving relationship, which is good, and personal behavior, which is not good. You can have a saving relationship, but your personal behavior is pretty bad. Always this separation. Bad behavior, my friends, is always an indicator of a bad relationship with Christ. Bad behavior, bad relationship. Good behavior, good relationship. Constant denigration throughout these theses of behavior, works, deeds, activities, by labeling it all legalism. We've been faced with that for quite a few years now. All right, let's see, is there anything else on this that I wanted to look at? A couple more. In the Christian warfare, we are active toward the fight of faith and passive toward the fight of sins. Let me read that again. In the Christian warfare, we are active toward the fight of faith and passive toward the fight of sins. What do you think? Just kind of wait for the sins to go away? James chapter 4 once again. James was a, was a what I would call an, an antidote against those who had misunderstood what Paul was saying about faith and works. And James is trying to get this clear. James chapter 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He will flee if you resist. This, well, let's read one more. Real victory, catch this one, is getting the victory over trying to get the victory. Can I read that again to you? Real victory is getting the victory over trying to get the victory. What? What exactly? That's exactly the, the issue there. Ephesians chapter 6. I think I read this a little earlier today, but it's worth reading again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Does that sound passive to you? You just kind of wait for it to go away? There is a constant attack against fighting against sin and trying to get the victory has led to a very passive and a very sentimental let go and let God religion. Just kind of wait and see what God will do. In which we sit, this was one of his illustrations, we sit in the passenger seat while God does, Christ does the driving. You may have heard that one before. And he will prevent the temptations from ever getting to us. I haven't read that in scripture, that he will prevent temptations from getting to us. All right, one more. Jesus was like Adam before the fall, in that he had a sinless nature. He was not born separated from God. Jesus was like Adam after the fall, in physical strength, mental power, and moral worth. So Jesus had a sinless nature, but he had a body and abilities that were not as strong as Adam had. So here, let's read it from Scripture. Hebrews chapter 2. I read this one earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. For as much then... As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, and by the way, whenever you see the word flesh in the Bible, 
Let's, let's find out what, what, what flesh means. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. What is pulling against the Holy Spirit in your life? Is it your body? It's your nature. The word flesh in the New Testament always refers to fallen nature. So whenever you read the word flesh, you can substitute the term fallen nature in the New Testament. It is consistent all the way through Paul's writings here. So uh, is, uh, is Jesus Christ uh, not having this nature? That's what he's saying. He was not born separated from God, and we all are. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, you know that one very well. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. All right, conclusion of this. Because of a false view of sin, we are born separated from God which is original sin. We're born condemned lost sinners. He is forced to believe that Jesus had a sinless nature. If he had taken a, fall, a fallen nature, he would be a sinner too, you see. Nope, Jesus had to have a sinless nature, which means that he couldn't be tempted from within his nature. Nothing within him was pulling him to do wrong. I don't know about you, that's my biggest problem. My fallen nature is my biggest problem. I have to fight that more than anything outside me. This is my problem. If Jesus didn't have these pulls, was he tempted in any points like as we are? Most of our temptations originate within our fallen nature. In the words of A.T. Jones 130 years ago, he's then a long way off from us. He is not our kinsman if he didn't have our nature. Well, since the 1980s, separating Christ physical nature from his spiritual nature has become a common thing in Adventism. The ultimate refinement, the ultimate refinement of the Catholic original sin doctrine. We have pulled it out all the way to its conclusions, and we are now teaching that. So here is what I wanted to share this with you. This was printed in Ministry Magazine in, in 2017. It is a very strong issue today. The 95 theses that Morris Vinden wrote, like I say, many of them are just good common sense. But I've shared with you at least a dozen of these statements that are totally false theology. A false gospel, evangelical gospel at its clearest. So um, since the 1950s, this has been developing. And this intensified to a flood of half-truths and false teachings in the 1980s. So I'm going to give you a suggestion. Everything you read or listen to or watch, and all of those are areas in which we gain spiritual information, must be with fully focused concentration. Don't just listen and think nothing about it. Concentrate on what you're hearing. Carefully analyze what you're hearing. As a teacher of mine told me many years ago, when you read something that is not inspired, when you listen to a speaker that is not inspired, you sit upright in a hardback chair with a red pencil. I think that's good advice because it's so easy to let things slip into your mind without even realizing they could be very dangerous. All right, so that is what I wanted to share. As I said, I would get very direct this afternoon in my last meeting about what is being taught among us. And perhaps what is the earliest book in the Bible, the book of Job, we don't know for sure. Job asked a very penetrating question. How can a mortal be just before God? Bottom line, how can we be right with God? And down through the centuries, this question has been standing before God, how one is justified, how one is saved. The most crucial question faced by Christians. Martin Luther asserted this, if we lose the doctrine of justification, we lose simply everything. He's right. He believed that justification is the article 
with and by which the church stands without which it falls. Luther boldly declared that the article of justification is the master and prince, the Lord, the ruler, and the judge over all kinds of doctrines. It preserves and governs all church doctrine and raises up our conscience before God. Without this article, the world is utter death and darkness. Well said, well said. Similarly, John Calvin considered the doctrine of justification to be the main hinge upon which religion turns. For unless you understand, first of all, what your position is before God and what is the judgment which he passes upon you, you have no foundation on which your salvation can be laid. And listen to Ellen White. The light given me of God places this important subject, justification, above any question in my mind. Faith and Works, page 20. And again, the danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind on this point. Faith and Works again, page 18. So given the importance of justification by faith for our salvation, it's amazing how confused Adventism has become on this subject. That is just mind-boggling to me. This is the keynote doctrine of salvation, justification by faith, and yet we are totally confused. I'm going to read a little bit from a review and Herald, uh, an Adventist review article. For Augustine, and remember he was a Catholic leader, third and fourth century, for Augustine, justification was God making sinners righteous by a conversion of their wills. For Luther, justification was God's act of declaring sinners righteous based solely upon the righteousness of Christ credited to their account. Catholic teaching, according to the review article, making sinners righteous. Protestant teaching, declaring sinners righteous. First of all, this directly contradicts what Luther taught. Luther actually taught, these are his words, this movement of justification is the work of God in us. That's not just a paper or declaration up in heaven. The work of God in us. Luther referred to justification as God's transforming us. Transforming us. That's an inner work. That's making us righteous. That's what Luther actually taught. But he had a problem. Luther affirmed that justified sinners were at the same time righteous and sinner. He had a very famous saying in Latin, simul justus et peccator, simultaneously righteous and a sinner. And why was he confused on this point? Because he believed in original sin. We're born sinners. Even though we've been forgiven of our sins, we're still sinners. Simultaneously righteous and a sinner. And this was due to his acceptance of the Catholic teaching of original sin. He bought it, and he believed it all during his life, that we are born sinners. So that becomes an issue even with Martin Luther. And then came along Melanchthon, the follower of Martin Luther, the one who took up where he left off. And uh, he said, just, he presented justification as the divine act of declaring sinners righteous. So Melanchthon was the one, actually, if you read history correctly, who modified what Luther taught on this subject, who reversed what Luther taught on this subject. So it was not Luther's teaching, but the followers of Luther. And unfortunately, this definition has been accepted by most leading Adventists today. We are declared righteous in the new birth. Justification. Here is from the review article. To justify, therefore, is nothing less than to acquit from the charge of guilt. When God justifies us, he acquits us. Not, uh, by, he acquits us by an imputation of righteousness so that although not righteous in ourselves, we are deemed righteous in Christ. How about that? We're not righteous, really, but we're counted as righteous. Let me give you an illustration of what this would really mean in practical terms. When you would return home from a tropical country, and you would be full of the parasites that you had picked up in that tropical country. Would you want the customs agent just to declare you free from contamination? Or would you want a doctor to make you free from condemnation, from, from, from uh, uh, the parasites that you'd picked up? 
The Protestant version has become declared righteous. The Adventist version has become declared righteous. Made righteous? No, that's Catholic teaching. We don't want that, so we are not going to deal with that. Seventh-day Adventists are heirs of the Reformation, but we do not agree with everything that the Reformers taught, I hope, because they taught some things that were not in harmony with the will of God. Luther, as brilliant as he was, never would accept the Sabbath, even though a friend of his told him about the Sabbath and how important it was. Luther did not understand some things clearly, and he was not clear on original sin. We must know the difference. Here is what Ellen White said on one occasion. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. Selected Messages, Volume 1, 372. We've got to believe in, orig in, in justification by faith. And Wagoner, teaching at the very time she was alive, said to justify means to make righteous. Wagoner and Jones were contradicting everything in their theological circle by saying that. Justification, to justify, means to make righteous. If it isn't making righteous, my friends, God is telling a lie. I declare you righteous, but you're still sinning. I declare you saved, but you're still very much unlike me. That can't be. God does not declare fiction. God declares first what he does. He makes us righteous, and then he declares us righteous. It's that simple. It's not the opposite way around. We're getting things twisted on sin, on separation, and on justification. So all I'm going to say on that is it's well worth your time to make sure you know what justification by faith really is. Don't accept someone's word for it. Not mine, not anyone's. Too much is at stake right here. Ellen White asked a pointed question on one occasion. Has the man a well-instructed good conscience, or is it biased and warped by his own preconceived opinions? We have to ask that about ourselves, don't we? We can have a conscience that's been twisted by preconceived opinions. She said, it is not enough for a man to think himself safe in following the dictates of his conscience. The question to be settled is, is the conscience in harmony with the word of God? Let's be careful, friends. Let's be careful we are not following our best sense, our best understanding. Check it out from the word of God. That reference is Mind, Character, and Personality, MCP 322 and 324. All right, that's what I really wanted to share with you in this last message. It is not a long message at all. I wanted to uh, point out that we have serious problems in understanding righteousness by faith in the Seventh-day Adventist Church today by leaders who have gone before us and by people you respect and listen to who you don't realize are teaching original sin and a false view of justification by faith. I want to finish with a brief thought on Christian behavior by a young professional woman. The concept of Christian behavior does not refer only to our relationship with others, but also to the way we treat ourselves. We practice being followers of Jesus in every part of our lives. This involves not just our interaction with others, but also the way we dress. We recognize that clothes can transform appearance, but can never change our character. This Christ-like character does not only represent inner beauty, it also involves our own bodies. It seems that God wants us to not only treat others in a Christ-like way, but also treat ourselves in a Christ-like way. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we read that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, meaning that Jesus lives in us and is represented to the world through us. We are called to honor God with our bodies. How better to honor God? than by taking care of this temple he has entrusted to us. This means taking care of our basic health needs, such as making sure we get enough sleep every night, eating well, and drinking enough liquids throughout the day. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, If you eat or drink, or if you do anything, do it all for the glory of God. Eating and drinking has something to do 
with our walk with God. And her point was simply our activities, our choices, both for ourselves and our relationship to other, have a real bearing on our relationship with God. Yes, those things don't save us, but those things flow, if they're correct, out of a saving relationship with him. All right. You've heard me enough today. I hope that some of the things you have heard may uh, stick, and you may study some of the things, these things for yourself to know what God's word really says and how God is going to change us from the inside out. And it is time now for uh, Matthew to take over. All right. We're going we're gonna to move right into Matthew's presentation. He is going to shorten down his presentation a little bit because uh, sundown is, what, 45 minutes away? And so he's going to give you highlights from his last presentation.